Worry was not uncommon for the village council these days, not on Emmons Field, and likely not in Watch Hill or Devon Ride, or even Tarn Ferry, though who knew what Tarn Ferry folk really thought about anything. Only two of the men before the fire, Aral Luhan, the blacksmith, and John Thane, the miller, so much as glanced at the boys as they entered. Master Luhan, though, made it more than a glance. The blacksmith's arms were as big as most men's legs, roped with heavy muscle. And he still wore his long leather apron as if he had hurried to the meeting straight from the forge. His frown took them both in, then he straightened around in his chair deliberately, turning his attention back to an overstudious tamping of his pipe with a thick thumb. Curious, Rand slowed, then barely bit back a yelp as Matt kicked his ankle. His friend nodded insistently toward the doorway at the back of the common room and hurried on without waiting. Limping slightly, Rand followed less quickly. What was that about? He demanded as soon as he was in the hall that led to the kitchen. You almost broke my... It's old Luhan, Matt said, peering past Rand's shoulder into the common room. I think he suspects I was the one who... He cut off abruptly as Mistress Alvir bustled out of the kitchen, the aroma of fresh-baked bread wafting ahead of her. There is more of this in the kitchen if you two are hungry, and I never knew boys your age who weren't. Or any other age, for that matter. If you prefer, I'm baking honey cakes this morning. Without waiting for a reply, she swept on into the common room. Immediately, there was the sound of chairs scraping on the floor as the men got to their feet, and exclaimings over the smell of the bread. She was easily the best cook in Emmons Field, and not a man for miles around, but eagerly leaped at a chance to put his feet under her table. Honey cakes, Matt said, smacking his lips. After, Rand told him firmly, but we'll never get done. Now, what did you do that you have to avoid Master Luhan? Matt shrugged. Nothing, really. I told Dan Alcar and some of his snot-nosed friends, Ewan Fingar and Dag Copland, that some farmers had seen ghost hounds breathing fire and running through the woods. They ate it up like clotted cream. And Master Luhan is mad at you for that? Rand said doubtfully. Not exactly. Matt paused, then shook his head. You see, I covered two of his dogs with flour, so they were all white. Then I let them loose near Dag's house. How was I to know they'd run straight home? It really isn't my fault. If Mistress Luhan hadn't left the door open, they couldn't have gotten inside. It isn't like I intended to get flour all over her house. He gave a bark of laughter. I hear she chased old Luhan and the dogs, all three, out of the house with a broom. Rand winced and laughed at the same time. If I were you, I'd worry more about Alsbet Luhan than about the blacksmith. She's almost as strong and her temper is a lot worse. No matter, though. If you walk fast, maybe he won't notice you. Matt's expression said he did not think Rand was funny. On their return to the hallway, they found a tray by the top of the steps and hot honey cakes filling the hall with their sweet aroma. There were two mugs as well and a pitcher of steaming mulled cider. Despite his own admonition about waiting until later, Rand found himself making the last two trips between cart and cellar while trying to juggle a cask and a piping honey cake. Setting his final cask in the racks, he wiped crumbs from his mouth while Matt was unburdening himself, then said, Now for the glee. Feet clattered on the stairs, and Ewan Fingar half fell into the cellar in his haste, his pudgy face shining with eagerness to impart his news. There are strangers in the village! He caught his breath and gave Matt a wry look. I haven't seen any ghost hounds, but I hear somebody flowered Master Luhan's dogs. I hear Mistress Luhan has ideas who to look for, too. The years separating Rand and Matt from Ewan, only 14, were usually more than enough for them to give short shrift to anything he had to say. This time they exchanged one startled glance, then both were talking at once. In the village? Rand asked. Not in the woods? Right on top of him, Matt added. Was his cloak black? Could you see his face? Ellen looked uncertainly from one of them to the other, then spoke quickly when Matt took a threatening step. Of course I could see his face. And his cloak is green, or maybe gray. It changes. It seems to fade into wherever he's standing. Sometimes you don't see him, even when you look right at him. Not unless he moves. And hers is blue, like the sky and ten times fancier than any feast day clothes I ever saw. She's ten times prettier than anybody I ever saw, too. She's a high-born lady, like in the stories. She must be. 
Her? Rand said. Who are you talking about? He started at Matt, who had put both hands on the top of his head and squeezed his eyes shut. They're the ones I meant to tell you about, Matt muttered, before you got me off onto... He cut off, opening his eyes for a sharp glance at Ewan. They arrived last evening, Matt went on after a moment, and took rooms here at the inn. I saw them right in. Their horses ran. I never saw horses so tall or so sleek. They look like they could run forever. I think he works for her. In service, Ewan broke in. They call it being in service in the stories. Matt continued as if Ewan had not spoken. Anyway, he defers to her, does what she says. Only he isn't like a hired man, a soldier maybe. The way he wears his sword, it's part of him, like his hand or his foot. He makes the merchant's guards look like cur dogs. And her, Rand? I never even imagined anyone like her. She's out of a Gleeman story. She's like, like, he paused to give Ewan a sour look. Like a high-born lady, he finished with a sigh. But who are they, Ran asked. What do they want? What do they want? Matt exclaimed. I don't care what they want. Strangers, Rand. And strangers like you never even dreamed of. Think of it. Rand opened his mouth, then closed it without speaking. The black-cloaked rider had him as nervous as a cat in a dog run. It just seemed like an awful coincidence, three strangers around the village at the same time. Three, if this fellow's cloak that changed colors never changed to black. Outside, Bella and the cart were gone, taken away by Hugh or Tad, the inn's stableman. Matt and Ellen stood glaring at one another a few paces from the front door of the inn, their cloaks whipping in the wind. For the last time, Matt barked, I am not playing a trick on you. There is a gleeman. Now go away. Rand, will you tell this woolhead I am telling the truth so he'll leave me alone? Pulling his cloak together, Rand stepped forward to support Matt, but words died as the hairs stirred on the back of his neck. He was being watched again. Then something led him to turn around to raise his eyes. On the edge of the inn's tile roof, perched a large raven, swaying a little in the gusting wind from the mountains. Its head was cocked to one side, and one beady black eye was focused on him, he thought. He swallowed, and suddenly anger flickered in him, hot and sharp. Filthy carrion eater, he muttered. I am tired of being stared at, Matt growled. And Rand realized his friend had stepped up beside him and was frowning at the raven too. They exchanged a glance, then as one their hands darted for rocks. The two stones flew true, and the raven stepped aside. The stones whistled through the space where it had been. Fluffing its wings once, it cocked its head again, fixing them with a dead black eye, unafraid, giving no sign that anything had happened. Rand stared at the bird in consternation. Did you ever see a raven do that? He asked quietly. Matt shook his head without looking away from the raven. Never. Nor any other bird either. A vile bird, came a woman's voice from behind them, melodious despite echoes of distaste. To be mistrusted in the best of times. With a shrill cry, the raven launched itself into the air so violently that two black feathers drifted down from the roof's edge. Startled, Rand and Matt twisted to follow the bird's swift flight over the green and toward the cloud-tipped mountains of mist, tall beyond the westwood, until it dwindled to a speck in the west, then vanished from view. Rand's gaze fell to the woman who had spoken. She, too, had been watching the flight of the raven, but now she turned back and her eyes met his. He could only stare. This had to be the Lady Moraine, and she was everything that Matt and Ewan had said. Everything and more. Good morning, Mistress, uh, Lady Moraine, Rand said. His face grew hot at his tongue's fumbling. Good morning, Lady Moraine, Matt echoed somewhat more smoothly, but only a little. She smiled, and Rand found himself wondering if there was anything he might do for her, something that would give him an excuse to stay near her. You know my name, she said, sounding delighted. As if her presence, however brief, would not be the talk of the village for a year. But you must call me Moraine, not Lady. And 
what are your names? Ewan leaped forward before either of the others could speak. My name is Ewan Fingar, my lady. I told them your name, that's how they know. I heard Lan say it, but I wasn't eavesdropping. No one like you has ever come to Emmonsfield before. There's a gleeman in the village for Beltine, too. And tonight is winter night. Will you come to my house? My mother has apple cakes. I shall have to see, she replied, putting a hand on Ellen's shoulder. Her eyes twinkled with amusement, though she gave no other sign of it. I do not know how well I could compete against a gleeman, Ellen, but you must call me Moraine. She looked expectantly at Rand and Matt. I'm Matt from Cawthon. The, uh, Moraine, Matt said. He made a stiff, jerking bow, then went red in the face as he straightened. Rand had been wondering if he should do something of the sort, the way men did in stories, but with Matt's example, he merely spoke his name. Moraine looked from him to Matt and back again. I may have some small tasks to be done from time to time while I am in Emmonsfield, she said. Perhaps you would be willing to assist me? She laughed as their ascents tumbled over one another. Here, she said, and Rand was surprised when she pressed a coin into his palm, closing his hand tightly around it with both of hers. There's no need, he began, but she waved aside his protest as she gave Ewan a coin as well, then pressed Matt's hand around one the same way she had Rand's. Of course there is, she said. You cannot be expected to work for nothing. Consider this a token and keep it with you, so you will remember that you have agreed to come to me when I ask it. There is a bond between us now, I'll never forget, Ewan piped up. Later we must talk, she said, and you must tell me all about yourselves. Lady, I mean, Moraine, Rand asked hesitantly as she turned away. She stopped and looked back over her shoulder, and he had to swallow before going on. Why have you come to Emmonsfield? I don't mean to be rude. I'm sorry. It's just that... No one comes into the two rivers except the merchants and peddlers when the snow isn't too deep to get down from Bearlon. Almost no one. Certainly no one like you. The merchants' guards sometimes say this is the back end of forever, and I suppose it must seem that way to anyone from outside. I just wondered. Her smile did fade then, slowly, as if something had been recalled to her. For a moment, she merely looked at him. I am a student of history, she said at last, a collector of old stories. This place you call the Two Rivers has always interested me. Sometimes I study the stories of what happened here long ago, here and at other places. Stories? Rand said. Whatever happened in the Two Rivers to interest someone like, I mean, what could have happened here? And what else would you call it beside the Two Rivers? Matt added. That's what it has always been called. As the wheel of time turns, Moraine said, half to herself and with a distant look in her eyes, places wear many names. Men wear many names, many faces. Different faces, but always the same man. Yet no one knows the great pattern the wheel weaves, or even the pattern of an age. We can only watch and study Later we will talk, she said. None of them said a word. Later. She moved on toward the wagon bridge, appearing to glide over the ground rather than walk, her cloak spreading on either side of her like wings. As she left, a tall man Rand had not noticed before moved away from the front of the inn and followed her, one hand resting on the long hilt of a sword. His clothes were a dark grayish green that would have faded into leaf or shadow, and his cloak swirled through shades of gray and green and brown as it shifted in the wind. It almost seemed to disappear at times, that cloak, fading into whatever lay beyond it. His hair was long and gray at the temples, held back from his face by a narrow leather headband. That face was made from stony planes and angles, weathered but unlined despite the gray in his hair. When he moved, Rand could think of nothing but a wolf. Shouting drifted across the wagon bridge, and when Rand looked to see what was causing it, his laughter became wholehearted. A milling crowd of villagers, from gray-haired oldsters to toddlers barely able to walk, 
escorted a tall wagon toward the bridge, a huge wagon drawn by eight horses. The outside of its rounded canvas cover hung about with bundles like bunches of grapes. The peddler had come at last. Strangers and a gleeman, fireworks and a peddler. It was going to be the best Beltine ever.